Awesome. So this is our second meeting of DIY Bio. And um, OK, in order, basically just what this is going to cover today is when I introduce our new officers, which were just elected. Um, and then we'll move on to the journal club that Dr. Bartel is going to lead. And then finally, we have some news about a new series of workshops called the iGEM series, which should uh, give you some more information on what iGEM is. And also, we're going to start the process of choosing a project, which is awesome. And it's going to be done pretty much completely by you guys. So if our officers would like to introduce themselves, you can go in the order on the screen, or you can just unmute and start talking, whatever works. <laughs> OK, I can start. Um, hi, guys. I'm Vidya. I'll be the coordination director or communications director for this year. Um, I'm a sophomore at ASU, and my major has said biomedical science, and I have a minor in business. Um, just some of my hobbies. I just love to like paint in my free time, and I love watching movies. Uh, but that's a little bit about me. I hope to engage with you guys all in the coming year as well. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tula. I'm a senior. Um, I'm in Barrett. Uh, I'm majoring in bio, um, the genetics, cell developmental route. Um, I'm also a four plus one student, so I'm in my first year of the molecular cell bio uh, master's program. And yeah, I'm really excited about the club. I'm excited about iGEM and yeah. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. I'm Emma. I'm your recruitment officer. Uh, feel free to come to me uh, if you have friends who would like to join us or if you know of organizations you think we should um, reach out to. Um, that's what I'll um, also be helping us with, growing our numbers. I'm really excited to form an iGEM team. I've been thinking about this for a little while now, but I haven't uh, had the coordination that Maggie has to get it together, so props to her. Um, what else? I also like to paint. Maybe we should have a painting session. Um, and um, yeah, I'm also in Barrett. Uh, I think I could also help you like reach out to other clubs if you are maybe an undergraduate. Um, I'm a junior, so I like, yeah, a freshman, I have some advice if you want to talk. Um, and I can put you in touch with other uh, clubs if you'd like that. So that's me. Hi everyone, my name is Zoe. Um, I'm a junior in Barrett um, and I'm studying biochemistry and I am the treasurer for this club. I'm really excited to be responsible for all of the money and all of the funds and I'm working on the iGEM project. I'm really excited to get started on that. Awesome, sorry, I have some trouble finding out all the Zoom buttons. Uh, Jacob and Chloe, I don't know if you guys just wanna like reintroduce yourselves. I know you talked last meeting, but just to give everyone an idea of who you are. <laughs> sure, I'll go. Um, hi, my name is Chloe. I'm a junior and I'm studying chemistry. Um, I'm the vice president for our club. Um, yeah, I'm also just glad to be part of this team and help develop it for the future. Hello, I'm Jacob. I'm the webmaster of the club. I'm a computer science major, um, but I've been doing a little bit of research with uh, ASU to in uh, the biological, the computational biological space a little bit. So I'm interested to learn a little bit more about, you know, biology and stuff like that. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> awesome, super cool. Great to have so many different majors and areas of expertise. Um, I guess just if you didn't know already, I'm Maggie. I'm the president, um, also junior in biomedical engineering like Emma. Um, yeah, and I work in research here in the same lab as Jacob. <laughs> so moving on, um, Dr. Bartel, I'm sure most of you heard him speak at the beginning there, but he is from SBHSE, which is in Fulton here at ASU, and he will uh, guide us through our journal club, which was attached, uh, the paper that we're going to be covering was attached in quite a few of those emails I sent you. So hopefully you got the chance to read that. So I will let him handle it from here. Cool. Um, I can stop my share if that works for you. That's fine. Hold on. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I didn't know. I, it's, I'm just going to share the PDF. I didn't know I was, I was going to do the presenting. <laughs> no, you didn't need like slides or anything. I just maybe if you wanted to 
give us a brief overview before people start asking questions? Yeah, sure. Um, I need to be enabled for screen share. Oh, so under share happens. screen, there's like Sorry. an arrow <laughs> that points up. It's okay. We all, uh, those, I went through too. <laughs> you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, there we're good. So I'll just cut to, yeah, I'm gonna share the PDF. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> this, uh, so this paper came out in, in Nature in 2011, and it, it made quite a splash. It was a pretty important um, step forward in the field of directed evolution. And I, for those of you who don't know, the um, directed evolution just uh, as a concept won the Nobel Prize this year in medicine. Um, one of the winners was um, actually a collaborator with my former lab. Um, Frances Arnold, who's at Caltech, and the what she and and others had developed, uh, including another collaborator of my of our lab, Dane Wittrope, was this idea that you can um, you can evolve, you can molecularly evolve systems um, to your benefit, and she had this great quote once that directed evolution um, accounts for what was it? for our extraordinary ignorance of biology, which really resonates with me to this day because like, you can learn a lot about biology. I spent a long time studying biology and I am still extraordinarily ignorant of all the different, of what's going on and that will never change. Um, so, one of so what she, what Francis Arnold really pushed forward was this idea that you could evolve things by causing mutations and applying selective pressure. But um, her first steps were through what's called screening, where they would do an assay and they'd look at multi well plates and they'd pull sort of the best mutant out of a, out of a series of plates and they look at tens of thousands of these mutants across hundreds and hundreds of plates. And that became the standard for quite a while. At the same time though, there are these other methods, um, one of which was called um, phage display. And, um, and there was a partner to that, which was uh, yeast display. And this is the idea that you could build these vast libraries of mutants and display them on the surface of a phage or display them on the surface of, a phage is a virus that affects all the bacteria, by the way. Um, display them on the surface of a phage or on the surface of yeast, and then kind of biopan, you know, screen through this, these billions of candidates to find the one that works the best. But, uh, so the work of Dane Wittrup at MIT was really focused on building out those libraries to get billions of candidates to screen through. And that remains a challenge to this day. There's entire companies that are based around the idea that we can make a library with 10 to the 10th antibodies that you could screen through. Or we can yeah, make a, a recombinant library with 1 billion different mutant enzymes that you could screen through. So. Entering into that uh, was David Liu, who is uh, one of the, I guess, preeminent synthetic biologists out there. He's right up there with like, I would say David Liu, Wendell Lim, who else is good? Um, oh man, I'm, I'm sketching the guy at Stanford. Anyway, there's a couple of people who are the greats. Um, Drew Endy, that's who I'm thinking of. Um, and uh, I think, I think Kevin Esfeld was a grad student at the time because then he went on to George Church's lab, who's famous for saying insane things and people listening to him. Uh, and so now Kevin Esfeld has moved on and now he's at the MIT Media Lab. And so he's moved up his sort of uh, evolutionary engineering from uh, microorganisms to entire ecosystems. He just he just made a big jump there and he's he's quite a controversial figure actually i was i was there for his job talk at mit and one of like the more most senior people in the bio department says you know a lot of people say things like uh, about technologies leading to the end of the world but what you're proposing actually will 
and he still got the job, so good for him. So these these folks went on to do great things, but the um, so this big innovation that they brought forward, and I'll jump to this next image, um, was to take this idea of phage display, where you have a library of billions of mutants and generate that library in situ. So it used to be you do PCR, you make a big library, and then you'd you'd uh, re recombine that into your phage and you go from there. They figured, well, what if we could make that library in the cell while you're doing your phage display? That was a pretty big innovation. Um, fortunately, all the tools for doing phage display still applied to what they wanted to do. Um, and the other element, which is a little trickier, I think, I think that I think this other element that kind of slips by the wayside um, was like a, um, a subtle step forward, but a big, a big help for synthetic biology. And that is that the way they did this was they created a, a selection strategy, not a screening strategy, a selection strategy. And they built it by taking the genome of this phage and they put most of it onto a plasmid called this SP, the shuttle plasmid. And so, so that has almost everything you need to generate what's called a recombinant phage. Um, and uh, if you're interested in recombinants, I'm teaching a class on it next semester. But it was almost, it was almost everything you need, but there's one piece missing, and that was this gene three here. Gene three is the is the docking protein that the phage uses to grab onto the E. coli and infect it. So you could conceivably make a phage with just the shuttle plasmid, but without that gene three, it wouldn't go on and infect other things. They took that gene three and they put it on what they called the accessory plasmid. And they drove the expression of gene three with their selection criteria. Okay, so they've, they've made this recombinant phage with a distributed genome essentially. And under perfect conditions, that should, just, that should just roll along as long as you have those two things together. And that's what they're showing down at. That's what they're showing down here at the bottom of the page. So they wanted to show that you could have most of your genome on your shuttle plasmid and then drive gene three by other means and still get a functional um, phage out. And so they start with just this T7 promoter. T7 promoter is um, almost all of, um, so most bacteria have this, uh, what's called a T3 promoter site, but there was some, I think it was a different phage out there that used this T7 promoter. So there's no natural T7 promoter in E. coli unless you put it there. Um, so they took this T7 promoter and they expressed this T7 RNA polymerase to drive gene three cool. And uh, not only did they do that, but on their shuttle plasmid up here, they had everything you needed to make the phage plus a selection marker. So this was antibiotic resistance. And so they show that here. So you grow your host cells, not a whole lot happens. Your, your host cells with the shuttle plasmid, not much happens. A complete M13 phage, you, you get antibiotic resistance and you see some growth here. And then here's their system and it works just as good as a whole phage. So they, they've got that. And then they tried a different way of doing it. So this is another artificial receptor. The, the, gal, um, the gal promoter actually comes from, I think, fruit flies. And so it's a synthetic, uh, synthetic system that they use to drive gene three. And lo and behold, you need to have the whole system for it to work. Great. And then they have this switching thing. I don't, I honestly don't know why they did all this different stuff for gene three. But this recombinase here, if you if you switch it on, it'll flip around and, and drive gene three. So they show three different ways that you can separate this critical gene and distribute the genome of your phage to get this process to work. Before I go on though, there's one more critical piece, which is great. Like you can make this phage, big deal. Like lots of people do that. Um, I mean, it's cool, but what does it give you? They add another plasmid here, and that's the MP, the mutational plasmid. So in your complete E. coli that's infected with everything, so you've transformed it with the accessory plasmid that has gene three, you've infected it with the shuttle plasmid, or you've transformed it with the, the shuttle plasmid to make your recombinant virus. That's cool. It'll go round and round and make more and more. 
But if you introduce this mutational plasmid, now everything in this cell starts to mutate, including the E. coli genome, right? But if you're lucky, you get some mutations on your shuttle plasmid, and that will introduce mutations into um, perhaps M, sorry, not M13, but into um, the genes that you're carrying from generation to generation. Now, you're also wrecking the E. coli genome by mutating it, but that's okay because the E. coli themselves are getting washed out of the system. So you're putting in fresh cells that have mutational plasmid and the accessory plasmid. They're getting infected with the, with the phage. More and more phage is kind of filling up this, this bioreactor chamber they call the lagoon. And then your mutated garbage um, E. coli get washed out. And so they started calling this instead of just directed evolution, they call it continuous evolution. It's a little tricky to set up. It's actually something that we're struggling with in my lab right now. I mean, we're struggling with even having a lab right now, but we're working on it. Okay, so they've got this whole system laid out, and they build their they build their their setup here, right? They have their um, accessory plasmid and their mutational plasmid, and they're going to mix them all together in the lagoon, and they're going to try to mutate their regular. Um, they're trying to mutate the T7 RNA polymerase. So remember, I said that is not an endogenous polymerase in E. coli. It's, it, it does not recognize the, the regular T3 promoter. And they're gonna to try to mutate it until it does. So cool, they try that and it doesn't work. It's just like that, that that's a disaster. And they thought about it for a while and like, oh, okay, maybe this is too big of a jump, right? You can't like, you can't evolve a horse to become the space shuttle. It's kind of a big jump, right? They're like, how do you, how would you get there through gradual change over time? Maybe you could teach it to swim better or something like that. So they came with this idea, like, why don't we make, um, just as like a starting thing, we'll take half the T7 promoter and half the T3 promoter and we'll mix them together. We'll, we'll have them as like one synthetic chimera of these two promoters. And we'll start from there and see if that works. And that did it. That was enough of a start for them. So where are we at with this one? Is that in B here? Yeah, okay. So they start getting activity and things start, things start to work. And um, then they switch from this chimeric promoter to their straight T3 promoter. And then they finally get a hit. Like, okay, good. Now it's starting to recognize it and they get this, um, this high activity of their T3 promoter. And what's interesting is they do this in two different lagoons, kind of side by side. And you would think like, okay, so this should just work again, right? It does, but in a totally different way, right? It takes a different amount of time. The, the, the result is different. And when they go back and they actually sequence these things and they say, okay, well, what, what were the mutations that led to this? They found that there were different mutations in different places. So that was actually really interesting because you might think, well, there's, you know, if you're gonna go from this to that, there's, there's a path to get there. It turns out there's not one path, there's any number of paths. And so this is what's evolution is what's called a probabilistic phenomenon, right? Things are gonna go in a certain direction, they're gonna happen, I think, but you can't determine how it's gonna play out. And even in two of these lagoons side by side, it played out in a totally different way and you ended up with different mutants to choose from. So, but still the process worked and that was cool. So as sort of part two to this, like, all right, well, let's try this with a different promoter, right? That, that would make sense. Um, and so they did it again, where they induced their muted, mutagenesis and they got right away, they got kind of a jump from, from their T7 to their IA6 promoter. And they found here, it was kind of interesting that they could change their evolution criteria, but it never really got beyond a certain point. It's sort of like leveled out there. And so I think that's that's an important thing to think about going forward. Again, I'm not ragging on their paper. This is 2011 and they've improved it since then. But but here they're showing like, all right, well, we can keep evolving and keep evolving, but you kind of hit a level here where things are working as good as they're gonna work. Hmm. So is that it? Oh, there's only four. I thought there were more to this one. Okay, so the other thing about this, again, it's important to view these papers critically is the T7 promoter is, is, was the native um, promoter for the T7 RNA polymerase, right? And so they're mutating this thing 
to get it to, um, to recognize a different promoter, both here and in this previous one. But notice that at least in, in this case, right, they have high activity on the T7 promoter. It actually gets better as they mutate it. And then it starts to fall off. Um, and then it grows some more over time. It never goes away. And the same thing happens over here, right? They're during their mutation, suddenly they get their recognition of the other promoter and it never really fades away. So even though there's um, improved affinity for the T3 promoter in this case, and for the IA6 promoter in this case, there isn't selectivity for it. And so that's one of the conclusions that they drew from this paper, right? That like you can evolve things in a certain way, but again, one of the, this actually came from Frances Arnold again, it's important. I wanted to introduce her in the beginning because she has all these really good sayings. So one of her sayings is you get what you screen for. In this case, you get what you select for. Their selection criteria here was how well can you activate this IA6 promoter? It doesn't say anything about how well you can turn on or off the T7 promoter. And so for the next like seven years, they kept, they tried introducing new sort of selection strategies, new ways of like tuning things. And it continues to be tricky of how do you get things to evolve to do what you want um, and then stop doing what they did before. The other thing I want to bring up about this paper is like they worked on promoters here. This is the, the simplest um, manifestation of directed evolution. And again, not dogging on their paper, like this is the first step in this, this direction. So, and they do, they went on to do enzymes and they're doing it with CRISPR now and they're doing all kinds of stuff with it. But as a first implementation, you want this very simple system, right? you want your, your selection criteria, which is basically encoding survival for your phage to be very, very closely linked to the mutation of the thing that you're trying to evolve. And so there's, there's like a one-to-one -one correlation. If, you're, if your promoter, um, sorry, if your transcription factor works better, then your promoter is going to um, code more survival. And that's very tightly correlated. If you wanna do something like make a better photosynthesis. How do you do that, right? That, you, that, this doesn't solve any of those problems. If you want to do something like make a better enzyme, this doesn't solve that problem either. And again, David Liu went on to design enzymes and a big part of that was like, how do you create selection criteria that allow you to do that kind of stuff? So this is a great sort of first attempt at this new method of continuous evolution it's a great way of generating these massive libraries. I think, I think they're saying something like 10 to the 12th libraries, uh, 10 to the 12th different mutants are being generated. And keep in mind like a really good commercial library that people would pay like millions of dollars for would only be about 10 to the ninth. So that's, that's a huge jump forward in our, um, in our sort of screening space. Um, Despite all that, like there's still so much we have to learn about this about this method and uh, and what we want to try with it. So I think that's all I wanted to say about it. Awesome. And yeah, I can open up for discussion or take specific questions, or we can just talk about DE stuff. I can, I'll go back to this one. This is the important bit. Yeah. That schematic. I do have a few questions, but if anyone else wants to start out, that would be great. <laughs> I don't mind asking the first question. Okay, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> I guess my first big one was maybe just a lack of understanding this, but so I, I, I- Yeah, let me preface whatever you ask with, I did this in journal club right when it came out maybe, and none of us understood it. We okay. were all, I was a postdoc and we we're all grad students were like, and they did what? And then, huh? So, and That's I've since talked to them and I've talked to like people who've done derivative stuff of it. And I've had a long time to like get comfortable with this idea. So if it doesn't make sense, it didn't make sense to me either at the time, but it, it will click to you. It, okay. you'll, you'll understand it better than me by the time in, in a few years from now. Okay, so my question was, so I understand well, at least I thought I understood that um, infectious progeny have the, I totally forget what it's called, but they needed gene three to get their, like their ability to infect these cells. 
and they yeah. started out without those, right? Yeah, they so started they... as j just uh, as just data. So they started as the shuttle plasmid. You can transform any plasmid you want into bacteria, and it can encode for any number of things. Mm -hmm. This plasmid encodes for a recombinant phage. So recombinant, um, that one. In 1980, recomb uh, recombinant DNA technology won the Nobel Prize, and it it revolutionized uh, it revolutionized bio biotechnology as we know it. Um, that idea began with with proteins of like we can make a recombinant protein, and it's, it's so called because that used to be the only way you could get um, you could clone things was through what's called recombinant, and we have much better ways of doing it, but recomb recombinant stays to this day. So um, I started with a protein, like can we express a protein in another organism? And can we recombine the genome of another organism? And the first drug for that, I think was um, Amgen doing, I think recombinant insulin, I think was the first recombinant. Um, drug. I'm just, don't quote me on that. It might have been um, EPO. It might have been EPO. It might have been insulin. But that idea that like we can make a protein in another organism and it's just as good as the protein you might make was just revolutionary for the 80s. Um, and it built the companies. It built Biogen IDEC. It built Genentech. It built Amgen all around that idea. And these are like multi-billion dollar companies to this day. So that was the first step. And then then in like by the 90s, people were like, well, can we make an entire recombinant virus? Like, is there enough? Can you encode that information? And you absolutely can because that's what phages do. They put their entire, like this protein shell empties out its genetic material and it's no longer, if it was ever alive, it's definitely no, not alive now, right? And so you just have a circle of, of DNA in there that replicates to make a new phage. So the, the conceptual leap is like, can I just make a synthetic piece of DNA and shove it into the, my bacteria and have it spring to life again? And then in the late 90s, or maybe, no, it was, it was early 2000s. This is going by decade. Um, Craig Venter hot off of uh, basically being allowed to do whatever he wanted after the um, Human Genome Project. If you read his biography, he did whatever the hell he wanted. It's a disgusting human being. And um, so he thought, oh, why don't I make a recombinant bacteria um, so we can take genetic material and basically just put it in an envelope and build a whole new bacteria out of it. So that became like the next step of, of like recombinant organisms. So that's what happens here. We have the code for this um, for this stage. And people have that for viruses all the time now. Like pretty much you can buy commercial viruses like AABs or lentiviruses, all the um, like gene therapy things, they're being stored just as recombinant um, plasmids that have everything you need to build the virus off of. So that's what's going on there. I guess, okay, I guess my question is more like a chicken and the egg thing. Like if, so they get their capacity to infect these cells through the uh, AP where the gene three is on. So how did the first one infect the cell to get that gene three, they transformed yeah. it. So, so these cells are um, they're probably electrocompetent. So you can get these plasmids into the cell by taking the cell, resuspending it in, in pretty pure water, and zapping it with a couple thousand volts, just like a like a you know if you run a gel, the DNA yeah. moves on a gel. You can electroporate stuff by mixing it uh, by putting it with DNA in pure water, and you zap it, and the DNA goes into the into the E. coli. You can put any um, any plasmid you want into E. coli that way. There's also chemically competent E. coli, which you might have used more of, which they just do it without the aid of, uh, of zapping. So they they start with just these two um, these two plasmids in the bacteria, and they have two different selection markers, and then they transform in the third, and then they just start their culture from there. And it doesn't matter how many um, get in, as long as one plasmid makes it in, then you can start the process. But once it gets going, then it makes its own phage and then it expands rapidly. Okay, so most so, of them start out without the capacity. 
Yeah. Okay. You would like a, you would have like a big vat, a big vat of growing um, bacteria. And then you would take, you would take these, a subset of these and you would zap them and get the shuttle plasma into it. And then you'd start growing that and then the phage would get rolling and then you start feeding in the fresh cells and get, get the cycle mm -hmm. up and running. So would the phage in this case be um, absorbing basically or, or using extra proteins that are coming from the AP plasmid in the construction of themselves? Yes, yeah, so think of it this way. Um, the, so E. coli have, they kind of have a chromosome. I mean, they have, they have an organization to their, to their genomes, but it's a prokaryote. It's just a bunch of DNA in there in a soup of, of proteins mm -hmm. and it replicates itself. Phages are, their entire game is they insert themselves into that process and they convince the E. coli to stop making E. coli proteins and start making phage proteins. Fair enough, that's, that's what they've been doing for billions of years. So the trick here is you just slip another plasmid in there. And so while the E. coli has been tricked into making phage molecules, that's, that's fine. Um, but it's also making uh, it's also making protein off of the accessory plasmid. It just so happens that one of those proteins it's making off the accessory plasmid is absolutely critical for the replication of the phage in the next step. So the phage is doing all the work here. You're just sort of writing that process mm -hmm. by um, by kind of baiting it. Like if you want to survive, you need to mutate and if you want more of this, you want more of this protein so you can live, you have to do what I'm telling you to do. Okay. And I, I guess my one last question um, is what DNA is being taken up into the phage for transfer into um, other E. coli? Uh, the shuttle plat, so phage, so recombinant phage plasmids, also called phage mids. Um, they have these packaging sequences on them. I don't know if they're called size sequences in phage. In, um, in human, in mammalian viruses, they're called size sequences. And they're a recognition site that some of the phage machinery seeks out and says, oh, okay, this this plasmid that I'm holding in my little protein hands, this is a special plasmid. This is one that I'm gonna load into a phage particle and launch to start the cycle. This accessory plasmid and the mutational plasmid don't have that special sequence. So the, the phage packaging proteins come along like, oh, okay, well, that's just some garbage, whatever. Oh, here's, here's another one. This is another phage genome. Get that into the, into the phage. Um, this phage has a dozen elements to its genome, or just, I'm probably wrong. It's some, somewhere around a dozen. It has a dozen different genes that encode its existence. And probably three quarters of them have to do with its replication, building new phage plasmids and packaging them into new phages. And probably there's, I think there's four genes that make up the entire phage, um, the entire phage particle. You can read more about this. This is the M13 phage. It's been used for um, phage display since I think the first paper was 1995 when it came out. So all these things were kind of well laid out. Um, it's funny, like the pr first person to do this, it was some obscure, like they did not know what they were, they did not know what they had when they developed it. It was something about like chicken sarcoma virus or something. And you're like, what, what is this paper? But it's this 1995 paper where they do this phage display thing. Does that answer your question? They're, the, the phage knows what is phage DNA and what is not phage DNA. Yeah. Maybe I, this I, should be prefaced by these plasmids are, there's always plasmids going in and out of bacteria. This is something that they do. Like plasmid, uh, bacteria recombine themselves. They swap plasmids left and right. Occasionally, one of those plasmids is a phage in disguise, and then they die. But in order to confer antibiotic resistance or disseminate um, information throughout their sort of their colonial existence, 
they make these plasmids and spit them out to each other. Sometimes they even have tubes, they project them along. So plasmids, I think that was the seventies when we figured out plasmids. Does anyone oh. else? Hi, I, I had a question. Uh, sorry, hi, I'm clicking. My name is Christina. Hi. So the way that they describe the lagoons, how does the constant inflow and outflow work? Like, or is a lagoon like a physical like vat or something, or is it like? Yeah, it, it. There's a there's a lot to it actually. That's that's um two grads, two undergrads entire projects in my lab right now is building out a system to do this in an automated way. So this is probably, this is a terrible example because they try to do two things at once. You've got a couple things going on. You have your, um, your stock culture. In this case, it's grown as like a, it's grown to a stable amount uh, via what's called a chemostat. So they give it just enough nutrients to divide at a, a set rate. And there's like liters of this stuff. And then uh, there's a tube coming out into their lagoon. And what they do is they apply, they have a pressure. So air pressure is pushing on their, um, on their, I'm sorry, their chemostat source, like feeder culture. And that goes into this lagoon. And it's, it's also like it's heated it's being stirred um, and the bacteria are somewhat growing in there, but mostly they're getting infected by phage. So they're not doing so well. There's another element to this, right? This um, mutational plasmid, it wouldn't be a very good system if the mutational plasmid was like going full bore the minute you transform it, right? The E. coli would all die. So you want that to not express and less induced. So also while this feeder culture is going into the lagoon, you actually have another chemical inducer to start the mutations going. So outside of the lagoon, the mutations aren't happening. Once it's in there, it does start the mutational process. So there's two things going on at once, right? You have the phage replicating and you have this mutational um, plasmid inducing to it. But it, it really is just bottles sitting at 37 degrees, either being shaken or stirred to keep the culture going. And actually the speaker last week, um, who gave the talk at the, at the bioengineering um, seminar last week? I can't remember his name, some guy at Rice. He was saying uh, that some labs have been doing this without the tubes and without pressure. They just come by every 20 minutes and they just pipette stuff in and they go on about their day. <laughs> Which, um, you know, if it works, it works. I guess that goes. if you can sit there and babysit your culture the whole time, you don't need, you don't need robots or automated systems. I was dumb enough where I built all summer. I've been building a robot to do this stuff for us. Um, so that's that's how that works. Does that answer your question, Christina? How how the the physical process is? Uh, yeah, but you didn't really. I may I may have missed it, but I didn't really catch. How does the outflow work? So I understand if you're piping stuff, pipetting stuff in. Are they pipetting stuff out, or does it like naturally flow out? And how do yeah. they? Yeah. So we make it waste that that exits. It, in this case, they, um, in this case, it's a sealed system and then they're pushing oxygen into it. And so they just have a tube going, I know they don't demonstrate it here, but um, there's a tube going out. And so if they, they push on it here, then for all the flow going in, pressure just pushes more um, liquid out. And as long as you keep it a sealed system, then you don't get, um, you don't get gravity pulling on it. I'm doing a system with a, um, with a peristaltic pump. And so the peristaltic pump just pushes the same amount of fluid through and you can put different lines on that peristaltic pump. So the same volume going in is the same volume going out. That's, that's you know, there's some plumbing involved but that's not really the biggest challenge to this system. So it's, it's doable. There's lots of ways you can do it. That's all I'm saying. People build different devices. There's a lot of papers on it. different methods people try. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should also note that even though you might think of this as like um, like giant vats or something going, but we're talking like a 10 ml culture here. This is all just on somebody's bench top. 
like it, this sketch they have of it, it's not any more fancy than that. Like there's no like machine with glowing lights. Um, there aren't like tanks going. There's literally a bottle with like an oxygen tank pushing into it and like two flasks and they're sitting in like a water bath with maybe a stir bar under them. And it's all super janky and this, they're probably sampling to get this kind of data out they're probably just pipetting out every 20 minutes. So in this example, like later they've gone on and they've made better versions of it. And there's um, there's actually a really cool um, platform that I've, I'm building right now that automates all of this stuff. So you have sort of automated sampling, but even then the volumes you're dealing with are like 10 mLs. I'm trying to get a larger culture where it's just like a, a 200 mL feeder flask, but it's not, it's not a large scale process. This all fits on like on a desk. Think about how many bacteria are in one ml. I think it is something like 10 to the 12 bacteria. It's a very large number. Is are all papers in synthetic biology this confusing? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um no, David Liu is a terrible author. He really is. I, I don't know if he's trying to do it. Like, I mean, the guy's at Harvard. You'd think he could write a clear paper. And there's, there is no, I mean, there's no excuse. There's no language. He's just because he's Harvard to get an English class from Harvard then. Yeah, that, that's no excuse. <laughs> I'll cut I mean, this from the recording. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. I mean, he's... He, 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 I don't. He's just not interested in it, I guess. Also, Kevin Eskel is a super. He talks super fast. He's got lots of ideas. He's throwing at you from every possible angle. So, I think they're combined. I, David Liu has clearer papers than this, but um, I think they have their own thing, and they're interested in doing that thing, and they're not as interested in sharing um, as as like educating you as to what their thing is. Now, it doesn't mean that. Um, Oh yeah, I should also mention that uh, this was funded, does it say at the end here? Author, N-I-G-M-S, R-01, okay. Oh, I guess it's not this one. Okay, they, that's fine then. So this is funded on NIH funded. They have other ones that are DOD funded and in those they don't tell you anything because they're not obligated to. They're like, we did this stuff anyway, it's great, trust me, we have a patent. Um, their interest is in patenting things, right? And uh, yeah, uh, David Liu is quite a character as well. Um, I think he runs, he manages the Harvard, um, uh, is it the poker team or the blackjack team? I think it's the blackjack team. So like he's this like high roller type. He has, he has a cool office and all this stuff, but he's interested in patenting these things. So he's not here to hold your hand through this process. He's not interested in like creating a community of like, continuous evolution, synthetic biology for everybody. He's, he's making bank off this technology. There's multiple companies that have been founded to evolve things and like, you know, okay, more power to him. It's cool that his inventions are, are so marketable, but his interest in writing his paper for you to get it, absolutely minimal. So that's, that's sorry if that's too raw, but that's, that's the way. If you go back to kindergarten and learn that sharing is caring. <laughs> <laughs> Not at Harvard, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I just I was having a little bit more difficulty with this than I thought I should be. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. Yeah, just keep in mind, like there are definitely better written synthetic biology papers where they try to walk you through stuff. And there's there's no community built around Pace. In fact, there's key. I I've let me. So I went to to recapitulate this. I'm like, okay, well, I, I want to do this because this is the best way to do directed evolution. There's key elements of this paper that are missing, so that you cannot you can't just repeat their work. Um, you have to build it yourself. And so I started down this road myself. I'm like, you know what? I don't know what he did with this phage. Like those plasmids aren't available. There's kind of rough maps of them, but I don't know exactly what he did. Um, and I talked to other people who've set this up. They're like, it's, 
I'm, I've been trying to do this for eight months and I'm still missing pieces of it. So I, I was like looking at this, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to build a new system so that at least I know how it came together. For me, it just seemed like it'd make more sense to start from the ground up and build my own system from scratch. And then like building off this work conceptually, but nuts and bolts, they're not giving that away. The mutational plasmid is definitely available on AdGene. You can use it. Um, but the accessory plasmid and the shuttle plasmid, no, they, they tell you what it is, but they're not going to give it to you. Other people have made it, and I think there's a patent thing because no one's sharing it. So there's some patent thing out there. I don't want to know. Yeah, that's that's one element of synthetic biology where you, I got into it because I thought it was a very democratizing technology. I thought it's something that everybody could do. But um everything um everything that you can uh, make money off of is inevitably corrupted and that's that's what happened with most biotechnology the promise of most biotechnology has been sort of squashed in that way sorry again i'm pretty cynical about this stuff uh but yeah that that's yeah, what you the see kind here. of stuff we should be learning during the second meeting so go on yeah, I was just saying, like, there are all kinds of democratizing elements of, of, system, of synthetic biology, right? Adgene is beautiful. Biobricks is beautiful. The, the things that people are doing and sharing with each other are, are just are great. At the same time, you know, that used to be the that used to be computer science. It used to be like, oh, nerd sharing stuff. And then you scratch a little bit below the surface. And there's all kinds of like toxic elements to it that are terrible. And in this case, the stakes are really high. So David Liu, like he makes this paper and like he didn't get the Nobel Prize for um, directed evolution. He knew he came too late for that, but there's literally billions of dollars at stake for this technology. So is he here for you? No, there's billions of dollars at stake and he works for Harvard. So that's, there's pressure to, to do that stuff. And so every time you make a technology, you have to think about that of like, well, who who funded you to get it? If it's the NIH, you're contractually obligated to share it. But then if you work for a major um, institute, they also want financial security and they want to get that through you. And if they're Harvard, like they're they're one of the most like cutthroat hedge funds in the world and they wanted this technology to pay. So most of the work that he's done since then, like David Lee doesn't publish that much, um, not because he's not busy, but because like if, if it's write a paper and have people pat you on the back and doing a job versus patent some, something and spin off a company, that's the choice that, you, that a lot of people make. And so you do have to navigate that in the synthetic bio world. Like, why are you here? So... Sorry, kids, it got into a very ethical thing. I mean, yeah, the other guy on this, Kevin Esfeldt, decided to stay in academia, but his whole viewpoint is that we should be using biotechnology to re-engineer our environment around us. Like his vision is that we can, I mean, he came from George Church's lab, who's like, we should just rebuild the whole human genome to be left-handed so we're immune to all diseases forever. And like, that's great, man. And they should be Neanderthals for some reason too, I guess. Um, but that's like the kind of view that that he's coming from. And he's like, okay, great. Well, that's normalized now. And I want to use CRISPR technologies to, re -en to engineer diseases away. Like everybody hates malaria. So why don't we just kill all mosquitoes? Like, it gets into these really sticky ethical territory. I mean, that's not sticky. That's pretty black and white to me. But once you start tapping into this, it's a huge thing. Again, like, CRISPR won the Nobel Prize this year um, in, it was medicine or chemistry? I think it was medicine this year, anyway, whatever. So CRISPR won the Nobel Prize. And um, uh, that was a bitter fight. Every single step of CRISPR was an absolute war between um, the Broad Institute, Harvard, MIT, and the UC regents because there were billions of dollars at stake based on that. And what is CRISPR? It's it's something they found in bacteria. Like, oh, cool, it's a little bacterial mechanism that does something cool. It was like plant researchers had originally identified it. It was nothing, but the minute it became, um, the minute they realized what they could do with it, it became a whole thing. And that's that's what you're tripping on with this kind of stuff. 
think about the scale of 10 to the 12th. That's a huge number. And to generate those kinds of libraries and to search that kind of evolutionary space, the possibilities are limitless. Um, and to who gets to control that, right? Do you get to control that? Should you be allowed, should you personally be allowed to design any, any type of peptide, any type of protein that you want? Is that okay? I don't know. So many, Sorry, I went on a, No, you're, you're good. Right. So many Same questions, question. so little time. Yeah. Um, I thought that was great. Unless anyone else has any other questions. I know we're running close on time and there's a few other things I need to talk about with iGen. Oh. Okay, um, like I said, this will be recorded and I'll try and send it out. So if anyone has to run, I can, I can, uh, or you should be able to access it once I post it. So thank you, Dr. Martel. Of course. Uh, there's a few more things left on this. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is, sorry for the sudden shift here, but <laughs> um, the iGym series is coming up and this is a new kind of workshop series that we want to plan. And uh, because I know that a bunch of you have questions on iGym and I haven't been able to answer them yet because I'm still finding the answers to those. So coming up uh, next week on October 29th, I'll make sure to send out some announcements about that, is going to be the first meeting, which is an iGym FAQ. Sorry, there's something in chat. Oh, OK. Keep saying hi. OK. Um, the iGEM FAQ. So there's uh, some graduate students who have done iGEM before at different undergrad universities, and they're willing to share some insight as to what their projects look like and kind of what lab work in general looks like if you don't have experience with that, or maybe what the timeline for it looks like, things like that. So if you have questions, um, that'll be coming up. They should answer your questions on that. And then the next thing I want to talk about, or the next meeting, I guess, is going to center around choosing our, our project idea so we can choose advisors after that, because I want this to be totally student centered. I want it to be completely up to you guys that you do a project that you are interested in. So um, there is a Google sheet here that if you click on it, it should, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it should bring you to a link um, where you're, you'll be able to put in your name, um, an idea that you want, that you think would be interesting in terms of like an iGEM project. So I would encourage you to look through the old, um, iGEM directory and see some past projects or anything that you find really awesome. And then uh, another tab for some external resources. So I'll share this and this will be open for everyone. And it's a good place to put your ideas. So that will start, whoa, okay. Kind of today I'll release that after this and, ah, okay. And once everyone has uh, their ideas in there around mid November, it'll be the second part of the iGEM series, which is where we have a, a Zoom meeting, like always, to discuss kind of what your ideas were and let people ask questions. You can explain your ideas in more in more depth than you would have been able to on the on the worksheet. And we'll also use that to narrow down these ideas into four or five that we think are really awesome and practical ideas. And then you'll kind of get into teams, like align yourself with your interests and assign yourself to one of the projects. And from there, you'll work on building your business case, more or less, for why you think that is a practical idea. If there is a researcher here at ASU who is doing something similar, so there would be like a subject matter expert who could actually help us out with it. Uh, and then present your case kind of in like a, a Shark Tank format, I guess. And then we can choose our, our winning team, and that will be the project that we end up going with. So yeah, I wanted this to be open to you guys to, uh, you know, I don't want to just have iGEM be some professor's research lab, which is all good and well, but I, I think this is important to be your own ideas. So moving on with that, um, in the Google Sheet, I explained it a little bit, but we want to know your name and then summarize your idea, not too in depth, but a few words on what you want it to be. So like, um, I want to engineer E. coli to eat plastic. So just something kind of like that. And then we also think it would be great if you could find like relevant papers to show that this has been done before or this is possible. Like we don't want you to come up with something totally crazy that we can't even begin to 
comprehend. So maybe just some extraneous information that would help us uh, understand your idea. And then also, if you could find, like I said, a researcher here at ASU who has some expertise in the field, that would be great because at that point, we could start looking for an advisor who would be appropriate for, for our team. So this is the next step in this. Uh, I really hope you guys start putting in some ideas. You can get as crazy as you want, but do keep in mind that we'll end up narrowing it down to practical ones. So um, I have a few questions in terms of the meeting dates here. I know in the, in the Discord, a few people were complaining about the meeting times. And for these, because they're iGEM series, we really expect that if you have any hope of being on the team or any desire to be on the team, that you need to show up to these and show that you care about it. So I want to make sure that these times are available for everyone. So I'm gonna put out, oh, if I can find it. Yeah, okay, this poll. So first of all, I wanted to ask just about what time works best for Thursdays because the first meeting is the iGEM FAQ and that's on October 29th. Um, so that's already set. I know that five to six might work for you guys because you're here, but I just wanted to check about that. Maybe later is better, maybe not. And then for futures, for future meetings and other uh, like discussing ideas, I was planning on maybe a Saturday meeting because that's generally open to everyone. And then the Shark Tank, because that requires you guys to build your business cases. Uh, and I, it's hard to do that during finals week, especially now that you don't even get classes off for finals week. Sorry, can you guys hear me now? Okay. Uh, there's a chance that we do that yeah. after what? We could hear you before too. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, there's a chance that we do that after classes are over just to give you guys some time to prep for that and make sure that classes aren't interfering with anyone. So looks like most of you have, oh, okay. Awesome. So I don't know if you guys can see the results from, oh, share with us. Okay, so it looks like five to six works, but maybe that's because you guys are able to be here from five to six. So I might ask the Discord about that one as well. So we might I end up doing- that, Is there a way to do multi-select? Because these were single select because, I don't know, you could, maybe you could have selected multiple times I work for them. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and do that um, better in the Discord or maybe in um, an email I send out. Thank you for bringing that up. And then Saturdays seem to work well for mostly everyone. And after classes seem to work well for mostly everyone. Okay, that's good to know. So I'll I'll plan the future meeting times around that. Maybe we can have multiple meetings. Yeah, we might be able to do that to discuss ideas. I'll, I'll think about that. Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, so aside from that, does anyone have any questions about this iGEM series, how it's going to work, or suggestions for it? Um, you, oh, you go first. Are you saying that this iGEM series is separate from DIY bio meetings? No. Well, so it's DIY bio, like general body meetings, like this one where it's kind of a, a journal club, or we might shift the format of that. We plan to have one more this semester mm -hmm. in probably mid-November. This is just for people who are interested in iGEM. They're, iGEM and DIY bio are, are going to be linked, but you can participate in one and not the other, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I had it clear so I could start telling people about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll talk to you after the meeting, so. And I've completely forgot my question, so yeah. Oh no, <laughs> feel free to email me. You know my, you know my email. Uh, anyone else or is this kind of makes sense and sound like a good idea? <laughs> okay, awesome. And that is all. So sorry I held you guys so long. I just, there was a lot to cover. Oh, Maggie, I wanted to add one thing. So regardless of what you decide for iGEM or DIY Bio, I will probably, um, not 100%, but like 90% sure, I'll be doing a SynBio boot camp during the innovation quarter. So during uh, December 
Tuesdays and Thursdays, I will walk people through uh, DNA construct design and how to use, there's an online tool called Benchling and just sort of take you through those tools and how one would make a DNA construct to do what you want. And then the first, or I guess the second week of January, um, I'll host perhaps in person, maybe not, uh, depending on the COVID situation, like an intensive one week, here's how you clone stuff. And the focus of it will be on, um, the focus of, it, of the actual intensive will be on a um, capstone group that's doing a bunch of cloning that I was originally setting this up for, but I'm opening it up. And so if your iGEM project happens to involve cloning and you'd like to learn about that, you're welcome to attend the first half. Um, and if there's specific projects that you need help on, like I'm gonna make myself available to this other group during the first week of, of January. So whatever you choose to do, that is there. And I'll, I'll send more information out uh, once it's confirmed that what the times are, et cetera. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, Dr. Bartel has a lot of cool stuff going on relating to synthetic biology. So I don't wanna just like open up his email for, <laughs> for everyone, but. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, it's not a secret. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Is okay. It the link? Oh. <laughs> uh, there you go, that one. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I guess I'll probably stop the recording now unless anyone else has anything. Uh, oh. Anything dire do they need to say that needs to be recorded? Okay. <laughs> if I can figure out how to do that. Okay.